I am entitled to miracles. I'd like for you to repeat that. I am entitled to miracles. Now, 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 the anchoring word in that sentence is entitled. So, come on, let's say it again. I am entitled to miracles. I only want you to say it one more time. But this time I want you to say it with some attitude. See, our theme is men of valor. And, you know, valor means attitude. It means I'm bad. It means fearlessness. It means boldness and courage, a sense of arrogance, but appropriate arrogance, you know. So let's say, I am entitled to miracles, because that's, that's, that's the attitude that we want to walk out of here today like a peacock, you know. You know, know what you're talking about. I am entitled to miracles. Uh, thank you, Reverend Lisa, for giving me the opportunity to play on your little playground here today. Reverend Paul for having set the tone and Minister Sherwood over here in this music department, the musicians, everybody who has done anything and everything to help set the tone for today. Uh, We also know that we leave here. We start right now in the attitude that it is already done. And we also agree with um, what has been said about who and how this theme is dedicated to our little brother Keelan. And those of you who don't know what we're talking about, you don't need to know. All you you need to know is the name Keelan. God knows. The Holy Spirit knows what we're talking about. And when I get to the end of this sermon, when I read to you Matthew 8, when I talk about the centurion uh, servant who was healed, you put Keelan's name in there. And we're going to have a prayer up in here today for our brother. And then we're going to expect to see something. We're going to expect to experience a change from what it is to what it already is in the mind of God. You see, at some point, we ought to start practicing this stuff. At some point, we ought to start just walking the walk and talk the talk. You know what I'm saying? Stop talking the talk and walk the walk. At some point, we uh, see what we do here is uh, our, our, our teaching here, for those of you who might be new to it, it is a teaching ministry, not a preaching ministry. And so what we do here is teach. Teach means to do what Jesus came to to show us how to do. To teach means to practice. Put it into practice. Men of valor. Valor means fearlessness. Valor means boldness. Valor means having a bad attitude. Valor means act like you are a privileged soul in God. You have privileges. You have privileges. You are privileged, and we need to walk and act like we're privileged. I have three points that I want you to follow. One is we're going to um, uh, uh, understand what a miracle is. We're going to, I am entitled to miracles as one. Two, define the miracle. Three, recognize the problem. Four, you are under no laws but God's. And five, it is already done. I'm entitled to miracles. Let me give you an example of entitlement. Scripture says, unless you become as a child. What does that mean? It's talking about having a childlike attitude of your relationship with your father. I want you to look at your children right now in your mind's eye. And if you're older and you were a child, remember when you were a child. And what your relationship was with your parent, what your relationship with those, that person who had, you know, uh, authority over you. And then everything that you know, everything that your parent or that your mother or that your father had was whose? (laughs) Whose house was it? (laughs) Mine. (laughs) Whose car was it? (laughs) Mine. They even bought you a car. And you end up driving their car because their car didn't have no gas in it. Whose car? Whose clothes is it? Mine. Everything. And then don't let them have a little cousin come over. You know, that's mine. So the parent has to teach them, no, you have to share, baby. That's mine. I mean, they they have their own bed, but whose bed you got to get them out of? (laughs) Yours. It's mine. So they have a sense of entitlement. And as they grow older, we have to be careful about how we unteach them that so that they might 
forget that attitude. They need to grow up with that. They need to hold on to that bad attitude. They need to hold on to that attitude of superiority. They need to hold on to that privileged attitude and consciousness of knowing what it is that theirs, that is theirs. Because you teach them, you didn't work for it. Well, Jesus didn't work for his stuff. You know, Jesus had a bad attitude too. Okay, because let's understand something about this attitude. You know, I expect a miracle. I am entitled to miracles, Jesus said, because he said all that the Father has is what? Mine. Mine. That's my stuff. Anything that the Father has is mine. Did Jesus ask for it? No. He just claimed it. He named it and he claimed it. That's mine. That's mine. That's mine. That's mine. And he knew he was a child of privilege. Don't lose that. You walk through life knowing that I am a child of God and all that the Father has is mine. Jesus had what is called a complex. As soon as you get a complex, you want to go to the doctor. I don't want to get rid of my complex. (laughs) He had an identity crisis. You go to therapy to get rid of yours. I don't want to get rid of mine. I want to be like Jesus. I'm just messed up. He that seeth me sees the Father. What? He that seeth me. Yeah, and I and the Father are one. You got to have that attitude. You got to have that bad attitude in order to realize that you are privileged as a child of God and as a son of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How? Because my power is not my power. The power I use is my Father's power. I have no strength of my own. I use my father's strength. I am entitled to miracle. I'm a privileged child of God. I don't work. The father works through me. Call it thou not me. Good. Come on, children. Let's look at step two. Define the miracle. What is a miracle? Let's look at A Course in Miracles references. It says, it is not necessary that you understand. So you don't need a class. You don't need a seminar. You don't need to hear a lot of stuff. It's not necessary. Jesus didn't understand miracles. Jesus just let miracles be done through him. He didn't need to go through a science class. (laughs) Of course, the miracle says the miracle extends without your help. It extends without your help. But you need it. That it can begin. So how is it then that you are needed? It just needs your mind. Not your body, not your money, not your stuff. Just your mind. Because scripture says, lean not, because he lean not unto your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him. So the Holy Spirit needs your mind. How does it need your mind? So that it can change your mind. Because the definition of a, a miracle is a shift in your perception. It's a rearrangement in your thoughts. It wants to take your thoughts so that it can replace it with God's thoughts. That's why it is written, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Not your mind, God's mind. So that's what Jesus, Jesus took on the Christ mind. You see, the Christ existed long before Jesus. The Holy Spirit was long before Jesus. Jesus came along and took on more of the Christ than any man recorded in history. He became the Christ and taught us that so as I did, so you are to become. That's why it is written, let this be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind, we're getting to the definition of a miracle. The miracle is a change of your mind. So when your mind is changed by the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the miracle shows up. See, so when some people go to the doctor and pray for a healing, then when they're healed, they say, that's the miracle. No, that's not the miracle. You need a house and you need a car. You don't know where the money is coming from. And all of a sudden it shows up. That's the miracle. That's not the miracle. The miracle happened way back when your mind was shifted. And it just took some time (laughs) for it to show up. And it shows up when your thinking is in alignment with the miracle that has already happened. God don't work with stuff. That's your business. God works with mind. 
God works with perception. And so miracles undo. Miracle does nothing. All the miracle does is undo your thinking. Miracle rearranges perception. And miracles reverse physical laws. The miracle, which is the Holy, reverses all your mess. The miracle reverses physical laws. And then, of course, the miracle says there is no miracle you cannot have when you desire healing. Now, the word healing means answer, desire, whatever it is that you stand in need of to attract, to, to, to repel, to get rid of, to, whatever it is. That's your healing. Healing is the answer. There is no miracle you cannot have when you desire an answer. Then it says there is no miracle that can be given you unless you want it. Now, let's hang out there for a minute. Mm-hmm. Should I give it to him? Un- unless you want it. Unless you want it. You see, sickness and wanting to be healed are not the same. They're not the same. Uh, having a problem and wanting it solved are not the same. Having a desire and ready for it to show up are not the same. Let's go to John chapter 8. The lame man lying by the pool for how long? 38 years symbolically means a long time. He had had that problem for such a long time. Here comes Jesus walking around. The man had made his way to the healing pool and everybody had gotten in was healed and he was there still. So Jesus asked him one universal rhetorical question that applies to all humankind. Do you want to be made well? Do you want this healing? See, he was sick, so he got there thinking he wanted to be healed. So spiritual therapy, which is A Course in Miracles and our teaching in New Thought, teaches you how to look into your mind to find out why you do not want the healing. What if the healing showed up? I mean, what if that man actually signed those divorce papers? I mean, what if you actually got that house that keeps falling through escrow? <laughs> you can't find a job. What if you got one? Do you know how that's going to affect your relationships in your life? I mean, what if that thing was approved? Do you know how your life is going to shift? What if you were actually healed in this situation? Do you know how many problems that's going to cause in your life? So do you want it? So the healing comes and why is it not happening? And you got to get in touch with that. And that's spiritual healing. That's what we call metaphysical healing. There ain't no scary word. It's spiritual healing. So it says miracles arise from a mind that is ready for them. So if your mind is not ready for them, it's not going to happen. How do you know when your mind is ready for them? Take the class, take the class, take the class. (laughs) How do you know? Well, let's shorten the class. See, a miracle shortens the need for time that collapses a thousand years. See, a miracle collapses the time that it needs. So a miracle happens in a head, it suddenly shifts your perception. So the answer to the question, how do you know when you're ready? When the problem shows up, you're ready. When the problem shows up, you're ready for a miracle. When the need shows up, you're ready for a miracle. When desire announces it through your mind, you're ready for the answer. You are ready. The miracle is ready. Get out of the way and let it happen. How do you get out of the way? Get your negative thoughts out of the way. Get your downward look out of the way. Get your fear out of the way. Get your doubt out of the way. Get all of your reasons out of the way. Get all these laws out of your mind. Get all the conditions, all the prerequisites out of your mind and let the miracle manifest because the miracle has already happened. Okay, step three. 
Lesson number 79 of A Course in Miracles says, let me recognize the problem then so that it can be solved. So what do you want to do is recognize the problem. What is the problem? If you don't know the problem, how are you going to recognize the solution? It says a problem cannot be solved if you don't know what it is. Then it says, even if it is already solved, you'll still have the problem because you will not recognize that it has been solved. And then it says, this is the situation of the world. What is the situation of the world? The problem. Now, did it say problems? Didn't I say problem? It didn't say problems. It says the problem. The, what is the problem? The problem of separation. The problem of separation, which is the, really the only problem there is. There's only one problem, but it says it's already been solved. So let's get some Bible up in here. Now the Old Testament teaches you what the problem was. And the New Testament teaches you what the problem is now. Was, is. Was, is. Was in the past. In the Old Testament, the problem was sin. But it says the problem has been solved. New Testament says Jesus doesn't solve that problem. Is. And in churches all over the world, this day, churches, teachers, preachers are reinforcing what was. And never brought the people into the New Testament what is. And keeping them condemned in sin. And if you take that sin from them, you must be a cook. <laughs> Don't you take my sin away from me. The Bible said, but the Bible said again, Jesus said, it is written, but I say unto you. The Old Testament law, New Testament grace. Grace supersedes the law. Brings you from under the law into grace. One time, not many times. One time. It's already solved. So what is the problem? Sin. But sin means separation. When you go to the Garden of Eden, it talks about the fall of man. Man from a consciousness of sin. Man fell into a consciousness of separation. Believing that God is out there and I'm over here. The rhetorical question. What is it that thou hast done? A rhetorical question. He wants to ask you. What is this that you've done? Confess up. You made a mistake. There is no, 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 no punishment for a mistake. There's a punishment for sin. There's a punishment for sin. But for a mistake, there's consequences. There's consequences. Because under grace, God's look at the heart and brings you from under the law and says, you're innocent. You have to see yourself as innocent from your heart. That's what Jesus is, te- is teaching here. And so and in, the, in the Old Testament, it's talking about the law of karma, a universal law of cause and effect. That still remains. Yeah. The cause is in the effect, and the effect is in the cause. You cannot separate cause from the effect. And then it's, in it is the law of comeback. What you put out comes back to you. But you see, what you have to realize is that under the law of grace, you got something that's built in called a defragmentor. You got something that's built in that's called a virus detector. In the New Testament, you got something that's called a new software. And that software is forever and ever updated. If you got software from 10 years ago, they got something new, baby. (laughs) You got to update your software. I don't want to pay for it. Maybe you got some bootleg software. But the point is, is that you got to get the good stuff. You got to stay updated. The New Testament is an updated software. Yes. And it's called, there's a virus detector in your mind and it's called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is on duty 24 hours, 24-7. Yes. And every time one of those intruding devilish thoughts, impish thoughts, what we call the ego thoughts, come into your mind, it cancels a lot. You can't come here. This place is occupied. This is my house. And it cancels it out and it neutralizes it and updates your program. 
Because that story is a psychological drama in your mind. And the problem has already been solved by Jesus through his new teaching and his new method and his new way. He says, you're no longer under the sin. Lesson number 76 of A Course in Miracles brings us to step four. And it says, I am under no laws but God's. Come on, Sister Previn. I am under no laws but God. You got to bring yourself from under the world's laws. All of these lies. Lies, lies, lies. He said the devil is the father of lies. You sitting up there talking to him. And he's not real. Something that ain't real, you're listening to it with a false voice. Not real. Not real. Okay, so what of course miracle says, think of the freedom and the recognition that you are not. Let me slow down. Think of the freedom <laughs> and the recognition that you are not bound by the strange, twisted laws you have set up to save you. You really think you would starve unless you have stacks of green paper strips and piles of metal discs. You, listen to the sarcasm of the Holy Spirit, you really think a small round pellet or some fluid pushed into your veins through a sharpened needle will ward off disease and death. You really think you are alone unless another body is with you. You think you must obey the... (laughs) You think you must obey the laws of medicine, the laws of economics, the laws of health, the laws of nutrition, the laws of immunization, the laws of medication, and of the body's protection in so many ways, the laws of friendship, the laws of good relationships, and the laws of reciprocity. You know, reciprocity. You are (laughs) on. I am under no laws but God's. So you got to shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Shake that stuff off. Why? Because of who you are. I'm a child of God. I'm a proud of privileged citizenship here. I am the father of one. I came from the father. He that seeth me sees the father. That stuff has nothing to do with me. I don't care how many died. That's got nothing to do with me. I don't care how many lost their jobs. Got nothing to do with me. I don't care how hard jobs are to find. That's got nothing to do with me. I don't care how hard houses are to get. What's that got to do with me? Who? What does that have to do with me? I'm entitled to miracles. Chapter 8, Matthew, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And the word here is, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. When? Immediately. Keelan? Immediately. Immediately, right where you are, immediately there's a power of the Holy Ghost surging through your body temple, rearranging every cell and fiber and tissue of your being. And the word of the God, the word of the Lord right now is causing all of the power of God to surge through that little body and heal it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we have to call it done and we have to open our hearts and minds and expect to see it done. It is done unto you as you believe. Your faith has made you well. Yeah. Here I am working long hours for the next Sunday for this event that we are going to have 15, 20 years ago. And here we are working, and then I get a call from a practitioner who says, my husband, you got to come. Uh, I was walking past his room, and I heard him moaning, and I heard him groaning, and I called 911, and they took him to the hospital. But Amon, I need your help. And so uh, I kept on working. I wasn't going to go to that hospital because my spirit was not hitting on all cylinders. You understand? And I was afraid that I couldn't rise to the magnitude of the task. And I didn't want to go there and be embarrassed. (laughs) 
Because they see I had a reputation. So, <laughs> so what happened, I just started praying and kept on working and kept on working and kept on working. Then it got laid over into the evening and the darkness was falling and all of a sudden I got the quickening of the Holy Ghost. I got the quickening of the Spirit and the Spirit said, go! So I went down to the hospital and the woman came to the door and she started saying, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear that. Just take me to where he is. And so we went to the room in the ICU and we pulled the curtains around and she was a practitioner. Therefore, she knew what we were doing. I said, put your hand on his head. And she put her hand on me. And so there was no long prayer. Suddenly. So I said, Roosevelt, you say thank you, Jesus. And he was lying there in a coma. Roosevelt, you say thank you, Jesus. He was lying there in a coma. Roosevelt, you say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit reverses medical law. And cancels out all the negativity that is all around. And then they put the man in the VA hospital. And then he, where he was a veteran, they transferred him to another hospital. And next thing you know, they had the police is going down the street looking for the man because the man went AWOL. They tried, to, <laughs> they tried to make him come back. He said, but I'm well, I'm well, I'm well. You crazy, man. You sick. And when Jesus was, <laughs> come on, come on, come on. When Jesus was, when Jesus, when Jesus, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion. Who is a centurion? You. So in churches all over the world this Sunday morning, they're preaching this sermon and they're talking about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We're talking about Jesus too. But we take the teachings of Jesus and apply it to you. We're telling what Jesus is saying, what you can do with it. Don't just sit here and talk about Jesus. Teach me how to do what Jesus did. This lesson is not only about Jesus. It's about the centurion. Don't overlook the centurion. Come on. You're the centurion. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. You're the centurion. I'm the centurion. It's talking about the power of the dominion of the man called the centurion. You have dominion over stuff. It says, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came into a centurion beseeching him, begging him to, go, to, to heal his servant who was at home. And the centurion answered and said, and Jesus said, I'll go heal him. And the centurion said, I'm not worthy. I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant will be healed. But see, there's two things here. He said, I, if you come to my house now, you get a contact high man and you... I got my, I got to go and take all my pictures down. I got my videotapes and all that kind of stuff. You know, you can't come to my house. I'm not worthy. But the point is, it is don't, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, how many sins you think you're under, how much, it doesn't matter when it's time for your miracle to manifest. None of that stuff means anything. Your past is not considered. It's where you stand in your relationship with, your, with God right now. He says, speak your word only, and I know that he will be healed. And, 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 and Jesus said unto the sincerean man, go your way. <laughs> Thou hast as you believe, so it be done unto you. And his servant was healed in the self-same hour. You need to let go of your mess. All, that old, all those old thoughts mean nothing to the Holy Spirit. And the same for whoever you're praying for and whoever you're praying about. Speak the word now. Closing, got to tell you how God works through me. I got to be a walking testimony. Here I am living in Oakland in the 80s. I had been a minister of the church there for a year in Oakland. They wanted me to remain. I said, I told you when I came here, I'd be here one year. Now, we accomplished what we were going to accomplish. Now, I'm out of (laughs) here. So my house was at a time in the real estate, you know, real estate stuff goes up and down where no houses were moving across this country. And so in my neighborhood and everywhere, houses just weren't selling. But I needed my money. (laughs) I was ready to go. What does that have to do with me? So I went to my source. Hey, boo. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, boo. See, I'm friendly with the Holy Ghost. Me and Jesus, we hang out and just common over everyday language. So he said, don't worry about it, I got you back. He said, now I want you to redo the landscape, okay. 
Now, I want you to paint the house this color. Okay. Now, when you finish that, go get you a sale sign. You don't need to call no real. I said, what? No, you're on. So here I am, boom, one nail. And the car stops up. Hey, I can sell this house. I can sell this house. Told me how many days. And I started laughing. And then he started laughing. He said, you're strange. It was a Holy Ghost laugh. It was the Holy Ghost laugh. It was the Holy Ghost laugh. And I started dancing. Well, do you know in a few days... I had a buyer, and in a few weeks, I was out of there, took the money from the proceeds of the house and bought me a brand new van. Then I was going to hang out with this money for a couple of years. I went to Oklahoma to stay for a couple of years just to chill and just to write. I didn't need no money. I had my money. Me and Urell. That was, I had only one kid then. And then so what happened is that while I was there, my mother became more ill. And my niece over here, Rhonda, called me. She said, you know what? This is your mom. <laughs> You better come on back home and take care of her because she was in overwhelm and she was in there, all of the load was on her. So I had to say, oh, Lord, load up a buggy and move back to, you know, like the hillbillies, move back to California. <laughs> so what happened is that I uh, moved back here to take care of her, but I got a place here. You know where the art museum is on, on, on Ocean Boulevard in Long Beach? You got the whole ocean right there. I got comfortable. Nice, big spread two one-bedroom apartments under me, and I got the whole one unit built on top of that, you know, so I'm living large. <laughs> but what happened is that then I got three more children thrown upon me, and then it was time for my mother to come for me to take care of her too, so I got caught in the real estate crisis here where not only where, where the prices had escalated, jumped up by three or $400,000 more than the house was worth. And so uh, Pat Penny called me. She said, Amon, I, I, I write down this address. So I wrote down the address. Go back and look at this house. I went back and looked at their house. From the outside, the house didn't look like it was large enough for us. But when I walked on the inside, the house had room for us and you too. <laughs> and so Pat said, you like it? I said, yeah. She said, well, you can move into it. I said, Pat, Pat, I can't move into it. The house was still in escrow. So she said, I told you the house is yours. The house is yours. That's the Holy Spirit. Some of you, you don't know how to hear the Holy Spirit. You don't know when the Holy Spirit is working. You see, when the answer is, when, when the problem shows up, the answer is already there. When the sickness shows up, the answer is already there. When the need it shows up, the answer is already there. When somebody starts acting a fool, the answer is already there. And so what happened is that I said, Roland, she crazy. Roland said, she crazy, but go ahead and do what you told That's her husband. Go ahead and do what she told you to do. So I moved in the house. Took the money that I was going to pay for the rent there and put in a new landscape. Tyree knows the story. A lot of people here know the story. And see, that what happened is, is that I had some money for the down payment. So I kept rolling. I said, Roland, when's she going to ask me for the money? She said, he said, did she ask you any money? I said, no. Then I asked her, she said, did I ask you for any money? She said, no. <laughs> Moved into the house without paying one single dime because the the answer was already there. I, 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 I just have to share the story with you to tell you, get conditions and prerequisites and stuff out of you. God didn't tell you that mess. Come on, I'm entitled to miracles. And so, let me close with this story, Reverend Schambach. I was going to tell him about Reverend Schambach and I was going to close. Can I tell him about the hospital? Yes. <laughs> Before this happened, I'm just walking around. So Tyree, I started losing energy. You know, and you know, men don't go to the doctor until they're dead. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, stuff wasn't right. You know, I just wasn't sick, but just, just not a mom. I said, let me go in here to this doctor, went to Kaiser. And so they looked at me kind of strange, and they told me I wasn't going home. Well, we, we'll give you a bed up in here. I, they don't even know why you walking around I mean it's amazing we're going to have to keep you and so I said uh, okay so I left <laughs> I, I, I got to go get ready so I went home and I, I, I got my laptop I got my books I got my papers and I got the stuff and I Called Rhonda and told her what she's gonna have to do with the kids, and then I did this and I did that, and then I called Jeannie because I didn't, 
I was on a secret mission. I just, and she wasn't supposed to tell nobody. Then, 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 then uh, I was working with the church, a guy that's church, and it was very busy there. And I sent a message there, don't want nobody praying for me. I got this. See, 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 you got to know about the laws. I'm going to put myself under that. So while I'm laying up in the hospital room, the, 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 the people come and talk to you. You're looking at you kind of strange. And then, and then they sent me one of these other people who's supposed to come and talk about your social status. And, da, 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 da. and is there anybody that you need to talk to? And, and do you do, 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 do? And are there anything? I said, well, I'll tell you what. This is the way we're going to work this. You do your part. I do mine. Now, just because I'm acting and doing this and that don't mean that I'm not saying I'm not sick. I'm just saying that I, I, I have a philosophy, and I have to practice my philosophy. You know, I have to do my thing, and you do yours. So they went on about doing their things. So they had all this stuff all set up in there. So then I'm sitting up there, and no visitors. I didn't have one single visitor. And I told, don't pray for me. I'm supposed to be there five or six days or something. So finally, the cleaning lady came in and sat by my side. She said, I just want to come in here and see who they're talking about out there. <laughs> they're saying this, and they're saying this, and they're saying this. And so I, I sit sitting there and talk to her. I wasn't there for two days, and I got evicted. I was all set up ready to get me some rest from my mama and the kids and all of that stuff and they kicked me out. You don't need to be here. But you know, it could have happened the other way. If I had seen what they saw, believed what they were telling me, accepted what they were telling me, then they would have seen you got to know what's happening. You've got to say, I am entitled to miracles. I am under no laws but God's. Now the ending story. Uh, in the 80s, there was a radio program. Dr. Rich, Dr. Hornaday, Dr. Richelieu, Dr. Murphy, and Dr. Shambach. Shambach was different from the other three. They were of our teaching. But Shambach was from the Pentecostal faith. He was a tent preacher, you know, goes all over the world. I went to hear him in San Jose in, in, in the Pomona Fairgrounds. Had several experiences with him for other people that I took there. So what happened was, is this. Shambach told a story, one that stays in my mind, and this is what I want everybody to leave here with. The Holy Spirit reverses physical laws in any area of your life. A woman came into his service, interrupting his service, begging and pleading him to pray for her. He says, she says, in 24 hours, my son is going to be electrocuted in the electric chair. But he's innocent. But the law has found him guilty. See, in the Old Testament, you are found guilty under the law. But in the New Testament, grace brings you from under the law. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And so what happened is that the man stopped his service and prayed for the woman and for her son. And this is the prayer he prayed. Holy Ghost, sick him. <laughs> Holy Ghost, sick him. That's what you want to say to whatever devil, ego, imp that is in your mind come bothering you. Holy Ghost, sick him. And on his way to breakfast the next day, he said he passed the newsstand, had to stop. The headline read, man saved from the electric chair in the last hour. He said he had to sit down on the sidewalk. He opened the paper and read it, and it said that in the last hour, they received a telephone call from a man who said, you're about to kill an innocent man. I did it and I can't let an innocent man die so if the Holy Spirit can do that for him what about your little mess what about this thing about a relationship what about this thing with a financial problem what about this thing with some lie that the doctor has said what about something with a problem with a child what about what about what about what about Holy Ghost sick him in the name of Jesus yeah, yeah, 
go tell that.